There's a certain kind of pop music that sums up the 1980s. Cheerful, catchy, synth-led songs like this little number from Kylie Minogue. A surefire way to get any party started. In this series, we explore the unexpected origins of the music we love. The driving force behind this 1980s party pop was undoubtedly Stock, Aiken and Waterman. Reunited on camera for the first time in more than a decade. Interview Mint, anybody? This talented trio will outline the methods they use to claim their controversial yet beloved place as the architects of this pop music success story. Stock Aiken and Waterman songs notched up more than 100 top 40 records in just a few short years. Despite its commercial success, cheeky and cheerful pop like theirs was usually written off by highbrow critics. Record companies at that time really didn't, they didn't get pop, pure pop. When it came to doing Kylie and things like that, which were pure pop. It was beneath them, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, they want something that's a bit bowy, a bit sort of, a bit over here, a bit sort of arty. And um, we, were, we were the opposite of that. No, right? no, well, it's a cool thing, isn't it? It's yeah, something to we're be not very cool. cool. It wasn't cool. And we just wanted to make music that regular people might like and want to buy. And the judge and the jury, they the blame on me, the blame on me. Stock Aiken and Waterman's music was unashamedly populist. The trio knew how to spot, make and market the next big smash. But history could have sounded very different if it hadn't been for... A Coventry Church Choir. Back in the 50s when I guess was my first episode into, you know, making money. I'm from a quite religious family. I realised that people went to church to get married, but they didn't quite understand what a hymn was. So most weddings we sang funeral hymns. We all sang the Lord's Prayer, which is about being put in the ground. So I very quickly realised, as a, a young chorister back in probably 57, 58, we used to get two shillings for singing at a wedding. If I charged an extra two bob and got four bob, I used to pick the hymns for the bridegroom and the best man and um, used to impress the bride's uh, mother, you know. So um, that's how I started, by, you know, hiring myself as a, as a hymn consultant to weddings. It sounds great, doesn't it? But it's a true story. I did actually do it. And uh, we then went on to get really clever. And I realised if we had bikes, we could do more than one church in the morning and one in the afternoon. So we could do three churches. You know, up to 10 shillings, and then I charged all the boys a percentage of their wages for being in my choir. That's, you know, that was my first entrepreneurial bit. Without the likes of Amazing Grace and all things bright and beautiful, the young Pete Waterman may never have discovered his greatest talent, the ability to spot a hit song. Pete Waterman had, had the common touch. I think as a, an a and man in the 70s, he'd picked up on records like Hurt So Good by Susan Cadogan, um, which was like a, a reggae cover of a Millie Jackson single. Yeah, it wasn't the most obvious hit record you ever heard, but you know, it was a top five hit. So he obviously had um, good ears for a, for a hit record. Pete Waterman had Woolworth's ears. He knew what would sell. And Mike Stock was possibly the most talented lyricist I've ever heard. And Matt A. Kim was one of the most talented musicians I've ever heard. He could play any instrument. In 1984, Frankie Goes to Hollywood were topping the charts. 
Torville and Dean wowed the world with their bolero, and Stock, Aiken and Waterman joined forces for the first time. Back then, a pint of beer cost just 73 pence, but even that was too pricey for the fledgling production outfit. I remember us going in the ship Wardle in Wardle Street. Street. Third pinch. of a pint each. Yeah, we had to pinch empty glasses and make it look like we got beer so that when the band come in, it was their round. That's, that's what we did. We had, we had no choice. That was, you know, we could pay, just about pay our rents and mortgages, um, but there was no money for luxuries. You know, Mike was lucky that um, Bobby was well, lucky well, enough to him. was a teacher, yeah. so she had a salary. Uh, I'd got royalties coming in from mu musical youth Nick Kershaw, so I was taken care of for two years, so I didn't have to... Matt was living salary. downstairs in my garage. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> That was for about three nights. Oh, was it? Yeah. It's oh. not as good a story seemed, as squat. All right, all right, I'll say that's true. That's true. <laughs> I lived in your garage. <laughs> their first priority was to assemble the state-of-the-art kit that would go on to produce their trademark electro-pop sound. Every penny I made, we bought new equipment. Yeah. We bought... Every, for me, whatever we needed to do the job, I found the money for. And so that's what I remember. There was no money, but by the end of 84, we were probably the most tooled up techno record producers. Though they surrounded themselves with the best gadgets on the market, there were still limitations. We had our image of what we wanted to do and where we wanted to go with the music, but the technology hadn't quite caught up with our ambition. No. So we were struggling most of the time with getting synthesizers, drum machines, whatever, to talk to each other mm. properly. Since drum machines and samplers like the Fairlight had all been in commercial use throughout the early 80s, but Stock Aiken and Waterman pushed them to the limits. We were at the cutting edge of working out literally how to tie all these machines up to work for us. Mm. Uh, we bought things in from the cinema, for instance, uh, from the film industry that, you know, were simpty clocks that literally did sync stuff up, mm. but nobody done it before us. The trio used their know-how to take the high energy sound of gay clubs and Euro discos and remould it to suit mainstream taste. It was this distinctive electronic sound that attracted the attention of their first number one artist. I had a radio alarm clock uh, by the side of my bed and I woke up and heard a record by Hazel Dean called Wherever I Go, Whatever I Do and it had syndromes, there's boom, 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 booms on it. I went to Muff Winwood, who was the head of CBS. I said, these are the producers I want. And Muff Winwood said, they're not producers, he's a DJ. We're two yardy boys who don't know anything, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a one-hit wonder. Um, and obstructed the whole thing. So I personally travelled down to London and went to meet with Pete Waterman. We were given three songs, and Spin Me Around was not one of them. And on the Monday morning, when we, we were at Marquee Studios, Pete Burns turned up with this cassette player and they'd written this song over the weekend, uh, which they demoed, which was Spin Me Round. Mm. And I said, right, let's forget, dump the rest. This is what we're going to record. You Spin Me Round was Stock Aiken and Waterman's first chart topper, knocking Elaine Page off the number one spot. But the weird and wonderful Dead or Alive were a million miles away from the record industry's idea of pop stars. Pete Burns used to work in Probe Records in Liverpool, and I remember going in there, and he was absolutely terrifying. He had these, like, um, contact lenses in that made his eyes completely black. He was literally the last person you'd ever expect to have a number one record. Um, he kind of looked like a pop star, but not a number one pop star. 
The only advice I received off Mike Stock and Matt Aiken was tone down your image, cut your hair and scrap the makeup. Girls won't fancy you. Pete Burns um, would always turn up in full makeup and drag, and uh, he's a tall guy anyway. Uh, you know, I'm only five foot six. He's got a booming voice as well. Uh, yeah, he's very. Booming. very <laughs> so, it, in a way, it's a bit frightening. One point they complained to Pete Waterman that they were upset because the band kept turning up in the studio all dressed up and it made them feel poor. The unique sound of Dead or Alive's biggest hit was produced using the trio's hard-earned new studio equipment. It was like the first thing we did with the fair light. Uh, did we use it on that? I'm not sure we did. I think we did. But a technical glitch made the track more distinctive than they'd planned. Literally at two o'clock in the morning, the machine broke down. And we had to wait for two hours for the engineer, Mike Pickin, who was the maintenance engineer, to come from South End to fix it. By which time, I promise you, we had no idea what we were mixing anymore because we'd been working on it since 10 o'clock the previous day. And Pete Burns and the band walked into the studio at about 11.30 the next day. And Phil Harding and I had not been to bed. And I honestly can tell you now, I, I couldn't hear anything. All I remember was saying to Phil, turn it up as loud as it can go so that the blood comes out of Pete Burns' ears. And as we played it, I saw these two and I could see that we'd left a sequencer in that shouldn't have been in. And I just went, <laughs> stum, because I literally, I'd, I just couldn't take no more. And that's the synth that everybody picks up on. Pete Burns just was like a, like a kid in a candy store. The minute he heard it, he just went crazy because it really was so different and so innovative for the time. It was just completely different. It still sounds fresh today. It does sound yeah. fresh today, yeah. Despite everyone's confidence in the track, it was not an instant smash hit. The record was stuck just before Christmas at about 40 to 41 in the charts. So. Pete Burns assisted, we did another remix. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I just don't know where to go anymore with this. And we got the Fairlight. We just uh, bought the Fairlight. We did on the mix because we got oh, okay. some BBC sound effects records. Yes, yes, yes. And on this, on this sound effects record, there was two dogs having intercourse. And this was like, totally freaked me out. So we sampled it. Oh, 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 oh! So we <coughs> called it the TDF mix, the Two Dogs <laughs> mix. And I remember Epic ringing me and saying, what does TDF stand for? <laughs> and I went, Tour de Force mix. And it's called on the record label, Tour de Force. But everybody knew the true story. Everybody knew what this was. So there was this, over the Christmas period, everybody was after the TDF record. So come, like, January, they pressed it and woof, it, st it shot straight to number one. And if it hadn't been for Spin Me, they wouldn't have gone on to have their major success with Vanilla Rama in America with Venus. Because Vanilla Rama went into them and said, we want to Spin Me. So they gave them Venus and that went to number one in America, bigger than ours, because it was three slappers. By 1987, smash hits for bands like Banana Rama had established Stock Aiken and Waterman as industry heavyweights in the world of party pop. Despite being a small independent outfit, the trio were now a crack team. They could produce hit singles in high volumes, and each had his own specific part to play. Pete attended to all the liaising with all the publishers, the record companies, all the lunches he had to do, all that sort of stuff. Um, and basically was our eyes and ears while we were stuck in this box 60, 70 hours a week. Matt could work things out technically as well and some things needed working out. How do you do a string flourish without an orchestra you know, that goes that's quite a feat of programming. Matt would do that. Matt would sit there and spend the time doing that. I came up wanting to be the writer. That's what I really wanted to do, write pop songs. I wanted to be Irving Berlin or Lennon McCartney. That's what I wanted to be. 
Little did Mike know that his most famous song, not the one playing now, would go on to supersize the market for their synth pop sound. The inspiration was an Aussie pop princess in waiting. In 1987, Kylie Minogue was famous as Charlene from Neighbours, the Australian soap pulling in millions of viewers on BBC Daytime. She was a big TV star. Everyone knew who she was. Almost. I mean, the point about Kylie was, I didn't really know she was a soap star, so... I can't say... Well, we, we didn't know who she was. No. <laughs> so it, it wouldn't have been that we had a... Because he thought, didn't tell us. Well, well, I didn't know either. Nowadays, we know Kylie as a Grammy and Brit Award-winning global superstar. But her singing career might never have happened, were it not for a mix-up in the trio's schedule. Peter forgot that he'd agreed that Kylie would come into the studio and work with us. I get a message, I come in in the morning and... you're working with Kylie now. He'd already said she's got to get on the plane at four o'clock. And this is about lunchtime, one o'clock, so I said to Matt, we better get going. Matt, we've got to do this song. I said... We're up against it here, mate. What about doing that? There was one. There was a track we'd started for Banana Armor, I think it was, that was in the can that we quite liked. But have they turned it down? I can't remember. Uh, uh, and I said, Let, why don't we do that with her? Uh, somebody said, uh, because if we because if we write if we write one in a hurry, it might not be very good. And I think Pit Stop said, she should be so lucky as to have one of your second best songs. Well, I think or, she, or something like I that. I think he probably did say that yeah. to you, Matt, but he didn't say it to me. Oh, didn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but he had a phrase. He was often saying, "I should be so lucky," you know, about love. But so I knew it was a phrase. That's all. So I was happy to go with that. And uh, on the idea that the word "lucky" would hit the echoes really well, it's a nice word to sing that. Uh, but anyway, having decided upon that, we wrote the song quite literally in forty minutes and got her in. <laughs> In less than an hour, they wrote the song that would go on to be the best-selling single of 1988. But I mean, to write a song in 40 minutes belies the years. fact that you've had all the years behind oh, you no, doing absolutely. it. So, you know, all been around for a long time. Yeah, so you just pull that expertise together to make it work. Yeah, and you have to in an emergency. The trio had been happily producing hits for other people's record labels for three years, but everything would change because of Kylie's imminent success. We didn't want, and it's the truth, we did not want to be a record company. We wanted to be record producers. We were forced into being a record company purely because of Kylie. We couldn't give the record away. I offered it to Simon Cowell for 500 quid and he turned it down. <laughs> That's because he's tight. Well, yeah. They launched their own label, PWL, in 1987. At the time, the indie scene was dominated by the cool sounds of New Order and the Smiths. Now it would be conquered by the trio's mainstream pop hits. Kylie's debut album would sell more than six million copies worldwide. We sold a million records when you physically had to go out and buy them and manufacture them. Had we had social media back then and everything that goes now, Kylie could have done a billion. Because even though you've got Taylor Swift and, and all these now, Kylie was probably more popular at the height of Kylie than, than they will ever be. You watch Kylie on top of the pops. You had to physically go to the store to buy the single. If you could have picked your phone up and gone plunk, 60p or 50p or whatever it's got, I'd be would be doing this interview in the Bahamas. I think the success of the early Stock Cake and Waterman singles came about by their carefully choosing of the artists who would sing their songs. So Kylie and Jason, of course, household names through neighbors. After a while, they'd had so much success, people kind of bought into their sound, and they didn't need to have famous people making their songs, songs, uh, singing their songs. I mean, people would become famous because they were singing for Stock Aiken and Waterman. We had this belief that anybody could be a star. 
I mean, it, it's actually wrong, but we believed it. Well, every, anybody, more importantly, we believed anybody had the right to be a star. And so therefore we didn't stop people coming up to us and playing as demos. And in 1989, a 17-year-old Scouser did just that when she saw Pete Waterman DJing at the Liverpool Hippodrome. So I just walked up to her and said, Pete, you don't know who I am. I said, but you will do shortly. I said, my name's Sonia from Liverpool. And if you don't sign me up, somebody else will. Um, don't say I didn't warn you. You know, and he was completely flabbergasted by the whole upfrontness, cheekness thing, you know. And he said, oh, you're a great kid, you. He said, um, mm, I'll tell you what, he said, come down to my radio station next weekend and we'll hear you sing live on the radio and see where we go from there. After proving a hit on his weekly radio slot, Pete wasted no time in getting Sonia a record deal. That night, I got into uh, Pete's fantastic, gorgeous Jaguar, which I couldn't believe there was a phone in there. No phones then, in, in cars. And uh, drove down our little street. And he said, I'll be in touch, kid, I'll be in touch. So I gets out the car, everyone's nosing out the windows, as you can imagine. And then they knocked on the door, mother went, where have you been? I said, mother, I've got a record deal. She said, get in and get up them stairs. She didn't believe me. Sonia's signing coincided with Pete Waterman's latest publicity venture, a countrywide roadshow promoting PWL's acts. And I was like, oh, I want to go on the roadshow. And Pete said, well, you haven't got a sunk. I said, well, can I just go on the roadshow anyway? He said, well, you can. I, I said, well, he said, well, okay then, kid, do a bit of merchandise, sell a few badges, whatever. So, of course, I'm on this roadshow, seeing everybody think, I just want a song, you know. And uh, But on the bus with all these big, massive stars, Sunita, Jason, everyone. And then one night, Pete came to the show and he said, son, you guys get to London tomorrow because we're going to have a song for you. Mike's going to have a song. I said, really? He said, yeah. So I went, went to the studio, it was unbelievable, sitting outside. And this is a true story. Mike came out and he went, hello, kid, who are you? I said, well, I'm assigned, I'm being signed to Peter. He went, has he told you you've got a song? I said, well, yeah. He said, well, I haven't. I said, oh. He said, come in anyway. So I went to the studio and we got talking. And um, he literally wrote that song in 45 minutes when we were talking to each other. And of course, the song was, you'll never stop me from loving you. Once again, the combination of Pete's eye for talent, Mike's songwriting skills, and Matt's musical ability had notched up a number one hit. Sonia has a lovely tone to her voice, and she's a beautiful person. There's no edge or side. She is what she is, and she's lovely, I think. Um, and at the very end of it, as she was saying goodbye, and she was very sweet about it, I said, I don't, I'm not normally this confident, but I said, oh, well done, Sonia, see you on top of the pops. Of the 17 other songs that topped the charts in 1989, more than a third of them were produced by Stock Aitken and Waterman. Stars like Madonna and Lisa Stansfield proved that it was possible to have number one hits and retain your credibility. But PWL's records were often dismissed by critics as lightweight and disposable bubblegum pop. And they just went on to have hit after hit after hit. With the, and you, you could always tell it was a stocking and Waterman song. And as a presenter on the radio, you'd get kind of fed up. Here we go again. Do you know what? At first, the backlash was like, oh, I don't really like this, you know. But then again, I thought, well, all this success can't be wrong. It speaks for itself. Um, and I loved the music. So I thought, you know what? What the hell? I, I, I love it. Everyone seems to love it and all the record sales can't be wrong.
In 1988, the nation wanted to see their favourite soap couple united in song. Stock, Aiken and Waterman happily obliged. They weren't afraid to give the public what they wanted. And this was all down to a 1981 dance craze that had given Mike Stock an important lesson in mass market appeal. Pivotal moment for me when I was in my band that had formed and we'd played in hotels. We were doing functions, weddings, uh, birthday parties in Park Lane, on, in the Dorchester and wherever. Um, and on one occasion at the Dorchester, it was the 12th birthday of a family, an Arab family actually, and they'd asked me as a band to play for them. And the mother, this was for 12 year olds, and the mother came up to me and said, could you play the birdie song? <laughs> And I said, we all knew it, of course, because everyone knew this horrible song. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm sorry, we don't know it. And of course, at the time we were playing Randy Crawford, You Might Need Somebody, for example, which has a funky bass and the drums all very clever. Uh, and that's what we thought we were. And then she came up to me a few minutes later and said, Mike, please play the Birdie song for the kids, for the children. I said, I'm sorry, we don't know it. We did know it. And then I'm starting to feel uncomfortable at this. And, Suddenly she comes up and she puts 50 pounds at my feet, put 50 pounds at the drum, at the foot of the drummer, the singer, the guitar, in front of all those 50 pound notes. I thought, oh God, I'm embarrassed to death here. I realised what a silly idiot I've been. I picked the money up and I gave it back to her. I said to the referee, don't touch that. I picked it up and gave it back to her and said, look, we're doing the birdie song. And the, the lesson for me was, you know, you're not there for your own in entertainment, you're there to entertain the people who are paying you. And I've taken that with me, because whenever I've felt that certain songs were beneath my dignity or something, I've woken up to the fact that it's nothing to do with you. You're making music for other people to enjoy. Stock Aiken and Waterman's cheerful brand of upbeat party pop had its critics. But it also struck a chord with a country looking for light relief in a time of rioting and recession. The early 80s was grim in a lot of ways and it coincided with the death of disco. Disco had been so phenomenally big in the 70s, late 70s, right up to 80, 81, and then suddenly it all got too much, and disco just disappeared off the face of the planet. And people didn't have records that they could go out and enjoy themselves to of a Saturday, Saturday night. Ordinary people, not trendy people in London. We brought a bit of sunshine in, I think. Oh, God, I hear my saying that. I feel like an idiot now, I've said it. By the late 80s, PWL had created their own genre of music with an instantly recognisable crowd-pleasing sound. But their winning formula could also be considered a thorn in their side. Stock Aitken and Waterman hit has a very catchy chorus, almost sort of nursery rhyme simplicity. The production sounds like it's just come out of, a sort of keyboard presets most of the time. It always sound exactly the same. Sounds like I never touched any of the buttons in the studio, uh, or never have changed any, moved anything up or phased anything down. Always exactly the same. There was no formula, although lots of people think there were formulas involved, or a formula involved, there wasn't. But they're all structured, all the songs are structured. So I'm hoping that anybody who hears it for the first time gets it. At least, they may not love it first of all, but they feel that they've followed the train of thought and they've gone, yeah, we're starting here, we're going here and we're ending up here. And normally you end up at the title, which is the crucial moment of the song. It's a matter of 
getting a snatch of melody, uh, what they call an earworm now, uh, that on one play will will connect deeply with somebody, possibly without them even realising it. And if you can um, if you can get that to be a, uh, a phrase or, or that's in common use as well, you've you, you've got a double hook there because it's it's a phrase that the people are already familiar with anyway. All you're all you're doing is sort of poking it and going. One of the trio's biggest artists was only discovered after Pete nipped up to Warrington to see a band as a favour to a friend. The band was pretty dreadful, but they got this one guy in the group that was quite different. He moved very differently. I said, not interested in the group, but if the kid wants a job, I'll give, it, give him a job. So Rick Astley was a youth opportunity training person. It was a yop. He, we paid him, I think, 30 quid a week. Uh, the government gave him 40 quid a week or something like that. He lived with me in my flat and we, he was a tape up. He came out to be a tape up, although we knew he could sing. The idea was that he learnt more about the music industry than just come along and sing. Um, and that's the truth, he was a tape up, but we always knew that he could sing. We actually recorded Ain't Too Proud To Beg as the first thing we did, so a Motown cover. When he'd sang for me for the first time in the studio, I thought, blimey, it just sounds very, very good. Why are we doing a cover? You know, we need to write something for him specifically. The song they penned just for Rick Astley became the top-selling UK single of 1987, outselling both Madonna and Whitney Houston. Despite the song's success, audiences around the world couldn't believe that such a powerful voice could come from such an unlikely source. That was the thing that I knew when I signed Rick. Rick doesn't look like Rick. Sounds. And I always knew that was a trick. I always knew that if we could make the record, that the minute the people heard him and then saw him, that it would be that water cooler moment when they went, did you see that little kid with red hair? It did not sound like anything like it. We always knew that. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Pete had to get the, the record company down to prove that it was this spotty kid yeah. actually singing, because they thought it was some big black soul singer we'd got. Sorry, can I say that? What? Black soul singer. Well, you have. No, it's a yeah. spotty kid bit. I was... <laughs> <laughs> So suddenly Radio 1 being Radio 1 thought they were clever, found out where Rick Astley was, and he was in Glasgow, so they called him while he was in the bath and said, if you're really Rick Astley and it's really you singing, sing now, live on the radio, which of course is not a problem for Rick. So we suddenly sing, so not only are they playing the record, but they're now playing Rick Astley singing in the bath proving he's Rick Astley. So you get double, you're getting double the whammy, it's fantastic. We're no strangers to love, you know the rules, and so do I. Stock Aiken and Waterman were at their peak between 1987 and 1989. In those three years alone, the trio notched up 44 top 10 hits, including 11 number one singles. 
And this is the famous missile room. More bloody gold discs. Their party pop production line had become as slick and high tech as their sound. Pete had constructed around us a great team. Everybody knew what they had to do. The control room, if we'd say, I don't know, so, we, so we've been working on Banana Armour one day and we've yeah. finished at one o'clock, what should we do now when well, we need to finish that track of something? something. The engineer would go, tape off, such and such a tape on, da 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 da. And it would be like, a, be like an operating theatre, you know. Everybody would knew, know exactly what they had to do and that tape would be changed over. The desk would be flipped, everything would be done in six or seven minutes. Stock Aiken and Waterman's assembly line approach harked back a decade to those giants of the American music scene, Motown, and the rival sound of Philadelphia Soul. When will I see you? Gamble and Huff, the team behind Philadelphia International Records, produced more than 3,000 songs in the course of their career. Inspired by their output, the young Pete Waterman paid them a visit in 1973. It was this different world. I mean, they were shocked to see a white guy at the door wanting to know all about black music. And who knew about black music? Because I knew more about their records than they did. So I was telling them about their tracks that they'd recorded 10 years before. And so they could see that I was a fan. So there wasn't this normal interview. It was like, what well, come in the studio, you know. We've got the stylistics in the studio, pop in with Tom Bell and Linda Creed and you can watch them writing songs. You know, Tom Jones was in the next week and they're getting ready songs for Tom Jones. So suddenly I'm in Philadelphia in this what was to become the hottest label, you know, in the next few months before, this was why it was all taken off. And there I was with all these creative people with a chalkboard on the wall that said, you know, next week, Tom Jones in. The week after that was Elton John, you know, and it was like, please have your songs ready for Wednesday. And it was like, ah, oh, you know, golly. But it was Britain's finest that really hammered the message home. I wanted to see David Bowie. I sat there watching it and it was like somebody switched a light on in my head. Hang on, it's all about pop songs. You sing songs that people like, you know what? They love you. There's no mystique about this. Look, he plays Let's Dance, everybody goes nuts. He plays the in crowd, everybody goes nuts. He plays some of obscure track that nobody knows and the crowd are polite, but you know. Come on, Dave, get us another one of your tunes. Let's dance. Hey, great. And I went back and said to Mike, hey, boys, we got it wrong. This is all about writing hit songs. Simple. The writers of my next single are Stark Aitken and Waterman. The feeling's gone, it's been just too long. But I just don't have a heart. I just don't have a heart to tell you. It's Stock Aitken and Waterman had created a unique and winning recipe for success. Established artists like Donna Summer and Cliff Richard lined up to join their already bulging talent roster. It was absolute chaos. I look back now and everybody goes, well, you know, you had all these hits. It was hard work. You know, I used to have to sort of sit in a dark room at times because the pressure on me was enormous. You know, I was expected to come up with the next Kylie number one. I wasn't, this wasn't, could you just go and pick a song? You know, we need another number one, can you go, you know, yeah, okay, let me think, you know. There was an air of expectation and that people were waiting for you to fail. And we, we always used to liken ourselves to Liverpool at the time because they were so successful, everybody hated them. But it didn't mean they weren't a great team, but it's the English sort of mentality, you want the big guy to fall. I would play the right records under his sufferance because we just played them all the time and they were just forever on everybody's radio station. In fact, the more people hated us, the more I loved it, the more I rammed it up them because it was the one thing that drove us on. It was the one thing. You know, when you're as successful as we were, you need something to keep going back to work. And it was the fact that we were hated that kept us going back to work. I had, you know, big friends in the record industry who were ringing me and saying, you know, you've got to take a break now. People are starting to hate you. Well, you're going to hate me even more now because I've got another one.
As the 80s ended, the shoulder pads and sunny sounds of Stock Aiken and Waterman were replaced by repetitive beats of a different kind. The edgier sound of Acid House. The landscape was different. Pop got a little bit marginalised for me. It did, yeah. it did, but my recollection was that people were buying records based on the experience they were having in the club. Yeah. Which is a bit like, and they were all on ecstasy, and that was the big drug of the time, you know. And we started to make records to suit people who aren't all there. <laughs> well, no, that's what I felt Fair we point. were doing. Fair point. With their record sales on the wane, it was Matt Aiken who was first to walk away from the trio in 1991. I think that I thought for some time that we all needed a break from it because uh, people said that our stuff all sounded the same, but there started to come a point where it started to sound the same to me as well. Um, and I think secretly I'd been sort of thinking we should maybe take a break. I made a bust up about something and I actually drove, drove home and I thought, and I'd never done that before. So I thought something's telling me Something's telling me something. And I just had my, my baby daughter and stuff, and I think I probably just wanted to... I think initially I probably just wanted to spend some time away, but um, I got quite used to not doing it, and I was quite happy not doing it. One by one, the rest of PWL's stable of talent followed suit. By 1993, Jason, Kylie, and finally Mike Stock had all left the building. During the course of a decade, their instantly recognisable sound had dominated the charts. Their prolific track record would never again be repeated, but their legacy still lives on to this day. If you listen to the charts now, you can hear us all over them. They're very much in the genre. They may not be, you know, they've got a lot trendier and they've got fabulous names to them, but they're not the homage is there. Today, Kylie remains a global superstar, and Stock Aiken and Waterman's much loved hits still ring out on radio stations across the world. There was a ray of sunshine in our music, and people listened to it with fondness. And not only the people from the 80s and the 90s that bought it, but now there's a whole new generation of people that just watch the videos and, and, and buy the records and, you know, who say, you know, ah, oh, it still sounds great today because, you know what, they were fun. Yeah.